church our video today is for sunday march the 7th and it is communion sunday please have your bread and grape juice or wine ready if you wish to join with us our readings this morning come from the first book of corinthians chapter 1 verses 18 through 25 and the gospel of john chapter 2 verses 13 through 22. We have a few announcements this morning. The Board of Christian Outreach would like to remind everyone that the special offering envelope for the month of March will benefit the Beacon of Hope Food Pantry. Food is a basic human necessity, yet many of our neighbors in Oakland County do not have enough food to sustain themselves. Your donation can help support the pantry as people struggle with food insecurity during the pandemic and beyond. Details on how to donate can be found in this email or 
in the March PV. We still need spring and Easter pictures for upcoming videos. Pictures must be in landscape. Questions and the pictures can be directed to Dave Meinhardt via email. And Dave's address is listed here. Additional details can also be found in the March PV. And lastly, mark your calendars. The Deacons will host another virtual coffee hour on Sunday, March the 21st at 1130 in the morning. Details to follow. And now let us gather ourselves and remind ourselves of God's presence all around us at every moment and every time of the day. And let us begin this time of worship with our opening prayer based on Psalm 19. Please join me if you have the hard copy in front of you. All creation tells the story of God. The daylight pours forth the goodness of God and the night declares God's wisdom. The law of God is perfect and it will revive the weary soul. We can count on the decrees of the Lord to bring joy to our hearts. Standing in awe of God will bring us comfort and peace, knowing that God will care for all creation. Let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, while we join together as one church with the words Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. The reading this morning is from the first book of Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided, through the foolishness of our proclamation, to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Noun, a flat, typically round piece of metal with an official stamp, used as money. Common, plentiful. You have a jar full at home. I've got a pocket full of them right now. Convenience stores have a tray full you can take to make up that tiny amount over your dollar. You talk about them more than you realize. Flip a coin. Stop on a dime. Penny for your thoughts? Don't take any wooden nickels. Cost me a pretty penny. Not worth a plug nickel. They're a dime a dozen. They're two sides of the same coin. Find a penny, pick it up. All, All day, day long, long you'll have, have good luck. luck. A single coin is almost worthless. Good only for a gumball or a song on the jukebox. And yet, in great numbers, they add up. A few years ago, Thomas Daigle made his last mortgage payment with 62,000 pennies. A Virginia man paid sales tax at the DMV with nearly 300,000 pennies. Little things add up. Small decisions pile up to make big changes. Good. Bad. It all adds up. Small sins. Tiny lies. Little baby indiscretions. A concession to temptation, here and there. But pretty soon, it all adds up. The book of James says that after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. We must count the cost of each decision. Like a kid at Chuck E. Cheese, torn between skee-ball or the crane machine. Think carefully how you will spend your coin. Think carefully how you will act in the dark when no one is watching. Think carefully about twisting the truth. Think carefully about that extra glance in the wrong direction. Think carefully about helping yourself to a little more than your share. After all, it adds up. A burden so heavy we cannot bear it. A debt so enormous we could never pay it. But though the weight of the burden would break us, though the balance on the tally sheet of our sins seems written in indelible ink, there is one who carried that burden. There is one who marked the balance paid. Infinite coins and currency could never equal the price he paid. Remember the hill called Calvary. Remember Christ's love. Remember the cost. Remember, Remember the, the cross. Our gospel reading this morning is from the second chapter of the Gospel of John. 
the Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Taking a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
pieces of paper and various metals. That's all money is. It is the value we place on it that makes it a way of exchanging goods and services, or for some people, determining a person's worth or value. Money isn't the issue. It's how we have chosen to use it over multitudes of generations or cultures that always trips us up. Jesus's reaction to the money changers in the temple isn't really about money either. It is about the value placed on wealth instead of prayer and sacrifice right inside the temple. It's our modern day Christian version of prosperity preachers with their personal jets and multi-million dollar homes. The Jewish people are in the midst of preparing for Passover. It's why Jesus is there in the temple. He is also preparing for Passover. They are acting no differently than we in the Christian church as we use the season of Lent as a way to prepare for Holy Week and Easter. It starts out innocent enough, but then Jesus witnesses a scene that in his zeal for following God's call pushes him over the edge. Here's the challenge. Faithful Jewish people traveled from all over the countryside to the temple in Jerusalem for Passover. They couldn't make the journey and bring all they needed with them to celebrate Passover, nor could they bring Roman coins into the temple. Roman coins contained the image of Caesar, who claimed himself to be a god, and only Yahweh is God. So these travelers needed the merchants and money changers so they could exchange their Roman coins into temple currency and buy what they needed to celebrate Passover and pay their temple tax. What is Jesus's problem? People are only doing what is needed to fulfill their temple obligations. Except that the money changers took a fee. It's how they made a living. And those who sold the supplies also charged top dollar. Supply and demand. And often, the poorest couldn't afford the additional fees and exorbitant prices on top of the temple tax, which put them on shaky ground with their religion. Notice I didn't say God. Jesus seems to be calling into question not just the fees of the money changers, but the entire structure which set up the poor for failure, as well as taking advantage of their situation. Passover was no longer a time of worship and prayer for religious leadership. It had become a way to make a buck. The heart behind the process was no longer focused upon God. Which of course begs the question, especially in the midst of pandemic, what is the purpose of our worship on Sunday? Being apart from one another 
has actually given us an opportunity to reflect upon what the purpose of Sunday worship has become for each of us. And what we most miss just might give us a hint as to what the core of our worship has become. Do we come together on Sunday to see each other and catch up? Sing in the choir. Learn from, maybe, and possibly challenge the preacher. Kindly, of course. Is our purpose about having the latest and most innovative styles and lessons and equipment so that we look relevant, especially to our youngest members. Why do we as church gather on Sunday morning? Please don't misunderstand me. All of those are wonderful secondary outcomes of our Sunday worship. The core, however, comes down to God. We are there to refocus ourselves in the direction of God, period. Worship isn't about us at all. It is simply a way for us to humbly come before God and remember who we belong to and in whose footsteps we follow. In that context, Paul would argue that our gathering makes no earthly sense then, that we look foolish to the rest of the world. The cross is defeat not victory. All this talk about people rising from the dead is a superstitious myth reflective of other stories in that era. We are wasting our time. Paul would argue that the message of God's reign breaking into the world overturns more than tables. It, turn, it turns our understanding of everything upside down. The poor are blessed. The grieving will find comfort. The meek will inherit everything. The merciful will find mercy. And the pure in heart will actually see God. The message of the gospel is for us to see the sacredness of all creation and an invitation to live that sacredness in all we do, no matter what it costs us. Now that is downright foolishness, and so it seems is God at least to the wise of the world. But what if Paul and Jesus are right? What if we are the ones who have horribly missed the mark while it is the way of foolishness that leads to the fullness of life? The foolishness that turns the other cheek that gives to all who ask, that prays for enemies and does good to those who hurt us. What if this seemingly impossible way to live does in fact bring God's reign and true life into the world one person at a time? Coins do add up, as does sin, as does goodness. 
God foolishly created us in God's image and then believed we would reflect God and God's love for others in return. God seems to believe in us more than we believe in ourselves. Yet maybe it isn't God who is foolish, but that God is wise beyond our human understanding. And the values we have placed on things and people are foolish. Maybe God's reign is the best way to live. Jesus came to turn our worlds upside down, one table at a time, in order to bring into the world a new way of being, a new way of living. It may seem a foolish way to live to those who do not understand the call of faith, but to those of us who hear God's whisper in our hearts, there is no other way to live than the foolish way of God. Amen.
as we partake of this bread and fruit, we honor the creator of all. As we bless and share these gifts, we celebrate the table fellowship of Jesus. Gathered as one body of Christ, we recall the Holy Spirit being poured out onto all the church, uniting us as one from our separate homes. We come together not because we are strong, but we know we need God's strength. We know we are not blameless, but in Christ Jesus, we are all forgiven our sins. Even pandemic cannot separate us one from another or from God. Bring your hopes and your history. Bring your deliberations and your doubts. Share in this time of unity, knowing that God loves you as you are. And so, God of grace and love, we ask you to bless these gifts of bread and cup and all your people who are gathered together in this moment among friends gathered around a table Jesus took bread and after giving thanks to the Holy One he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take this all of you and eat it this is my body which is given for you whenever you do this do it to remember me Later, after they had eaten, Jesus took a cup of wine. And after giving thanks to the Holy One, he said, take this, all of you, and drink. This is God's new covenant with all of God's people. It is made possible by my death and resurrection. Whenever you drink it, do it to remember me. Gracious God, we give you thanks that you have refreshed us at your table, granting us your presence. Here we have gathered as one church, as your spirit unites us across all space and time. We offer you the prayers which we hold in our hearts while we also lift up those on the front lines of this pandemic, all those hurting, all victims of violence, and all those in need. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth in courage and peace to proclaim the good news of your love. And so together, we do pray. Hear the cries of your people, O Lord. Our help is in you, creator of all heaven and earth. Bend your ear to us and grant us the desires of our heart. May your spirit be with us all. And your son bring mercy to our world. Amen.
All right, Mark, let's try this again. As you go about the coming week, my prayer for you is that you will trust in the ways of God's reign. Believe that God is not turning our lives upside down, but right side up, giving us the wisdom to live in the ways in which we were created to live in the first place. May the Spirit grant you courage and discernment. And may the life of Jesus be your guide in all you do. Resurrection is our hope and new life is our call. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. May God's blessings to continue to be with us all. Remember that God loves you, as do I. Be safe, church. God willing, we'll see you again next week via YouTube. Let the church say, Amen. That's what it feels like. All right, we ready? Mm -hmm. Ready? Eh.